Well, good morning. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, if you've been around Fort Alliance for more than a minute, uh, you know that I love holidays, right? Uh, in fact, September, October, November, December is my favorite semester. <laughs> I, I still think in terms of semesters, even though I'm an adult now. Um, yes, yeah, so it's my favorite semester, and I think that's because it's it's a tradition bonanza, right? I just, I love tradition. I love everything that comes with it. Um, and I want to know just what some of uh, your traditional Thanksgiving foods are, but more specifically, I want to know um, if you could only pick one food to have from your Thanksgiving dinner. If someone came in, they stole it all, and they're like, I'll just leave you one thing. I want to know what you would choose to keep. Now, gravy is is automatic. You can have gravy because, in my opinion, um, no Thanksgiving dinner should be eaten without gravy, and I wouldn't want any of it, really, if it wasn't covered in gravy. But you can't just eat gravy by itself, so gravy is automatically added. So take a moment, chat with those around you, and tell them if you could only have one item from the Thanksgiving dinner, including gravy, what would it be? All right, so I know we could talk about Thanksgiving dinner for hours and hours. Uh, let's overhear someone shout out. What was your thing? You canceled each other out. Say again. Cabbage rolls. Pastor Ken showed a cabbage rolls in the first service. Brenda. Oh, potato buns baked in cream. Lots of Ukrainian representation here. Over here. Pumpkin pie. I made a marshmallow pumpkin pie yesterday, which I'm going to see how it is. I'm pretty excited. So, you know, from the chatter in here, I would say even if you don't love tradition as much as I do, or, you know, you're not as much of a holiday fiend as I am, everyone can still get behind a big dinner, right? Everybody likes, most everybody likes a big dinner. So speaking of big dinners and traditions, another tradition that I love here at Fort Alliance is that yearly we pack Thanksgiving baskets for folks in our community who might not be able to afford a Thanksgiving basket uh, if uh, otherwise than them receiving one. One of the lines in our mission statement, Pastor Ken spoke a bit about our mission statement uh, when he was doing announcements before. One of our lines is serve the fort. And it is so important to who we are here at Fort Alliance uh, that we are serving the fort. We want to be a church that matters to our community. And when I say a church that matters, what I mean is I often think if Fort Alliance just disappeared like that, would our community care? Would it affect them negatively to have us gone? And my fervent hope and prayer is that we will be a place that matters to our community. So on Friday, uh, we were able to go to the food bank and pack these baskets. Uh, we were able to pack 86 baskets this year, which is really exciting. That's kind of double what we did in previous years. And these included like extra snacks, some chips, stuff like that to eat while you're making your Thanksgiving dinner. We were really excited to be able to part, be a part of that. I have some pictures I want to show. So there are the baskets all ready to go, 86 of them. Um, next picture, how cute is this? Little Aria helping. She packed that gravy like a champion. All right, next picture. 
we can see we had to haul the boxes. It was a lot of work. It was, it was good. And look at this. We have teenagers from our, from our church community helping us pack. I love that. I love any opportunity where we can come together, different generations, and serve. Oh, that is such a beautiful picture of the church. So thank you, church. Thank you for providing the funds uh, to be able to purchase the ingredients for these dinners. Thank you for taking time to pack the baskets. Thank you for your prayers for the people receiving these baskets. You bless me. I don't think you know how proud I am of you, Fort Alliance. When I am out in the community doing things on behalf of the church, and I hear people talking about our church, and I hear people talking about the way that we serve and the way that we love, and my heart just bursts with the good kind of pride. I'm like, yes, those are right people. It's so exciting. So thank you so much. Well, for the rest of our time this morning, we're going to be talking about another type of Thanksgiving meal. We are going to be talking about the Lord's Supper and the tradition of the Lord's Supper. And whether you like tradition or not, I think this is also a tradition that you can get behind. It is oh so important for us as believers. And it seems appropriate that at this time of year where we actually take a second and stop, which for us to do um, in our busy, busy life, but we actually take a moment, we stop, and we think, what are we thankful for? It seems so appropriate to be, to take some time and to be thankful for the fact that we can come to the Lord's table together and what that means. William Morley Punchin sums it up well when he says, surely there is a fitness in the institution of the Lord's Supper as a standing memorial by which the church at large may commemorate the grandest act and by which the heart of each individual believer may be reminded of their dearest friend. You who have learned to love the Savior will prize his ordinance for the Savior's sake. You who rejoice in the salvation purchased by his dying will not fail with gratitude and faith to show the Lord's death until he comes. So let's start by looking at the first ever communion. We find in scripture in Matthew 26, Jesus instituting coming to what we now refer to as the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. So turn with me to Matthew 26. We're going to read verse 26 to 29. It's going to be up on the screen. If you have your Bible, feel free to follow along. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to gift you one. You can find anybody with a name tag on after the service. They would love to hand you a copy of the scriptures that you can keep for yourself. So we're Matthew 26, 26 to 29. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the disciples and Jesus, they're gathered together to eat a dinner. It's not just any dinner. It's not like, you know, Tuesday, Taco Tuesday, spaghetti, meatballs. It's a very special dinner that they're gathered to eat. And it is something called the Passover meal. And Passover was a Jewish festival that was celebrated yearly. And it actually, it had a long-standing history. It originated approximately 13 to 1500 years before Jesus was sitting there and having the first communion with his disciples. And so quickly, quickly, we're going to talk about how Passover came to be. This might be familiar to some of you, but through a string of factors and events that I don't have time to get into right now, but I encourage you, go and read the book of Exodus and, and study this because it's really fascinating. It's a beautiful, beautiful retelling. Um, but through a string of factors, uh, God's people find themselves in Egypt. They're in Egypt. They are under slavery. They also are experiencing infanticide. Their um, male babies babies are being murdered in order to try to keep the population under control. And so God's people, they cry out to God for deliverance. They say, hear our prayers and deliver us from this horrible situation. And of course, God hears their prayers and he raises up Moses to lead the people out of Egypt and into the promised land. 
However, Pharaoh, as you can imagine, most people who have enslaved a, a nation, they don't really want to give up their free slave labor, right? And so no, or, uh, Pharaoh says, no, I'm absolutely not letting you go. And so this enters into this big saga where Moses and Pharaoh go back and forth, and, and God sends these plagues to convince Pharaoh to let the people go and to show his power and show his care for his people. And so there's nine plagues, and then we get to the final one, we get to the tenth one, and that's the one that we're going to focus on today. So turn with me to Exodus 11, 4 to 7. All right, so this is the final plague, number 10. It is truly terrible. Moses announces to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, at midnight tonight I will pass through the heart of Egypt. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the lowliest, to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the grain. Even the firstborn of all the livestock will die. Then a loud wail will rise through the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has heard before or will ever hear again. But among the Israelites, it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark." All right, so this is the 10th plague that's coming on the people of Israel. Uh, God is about to deliver his people. But while the Israelite, while Passover is happening, the Israelites don't just sit still. God gives them a set of very special instructions that they need to follow while while the angel of death is coming through so that they will remain safe. So let's just, uh, next chapter, Exodus 12, up on the screen for you. Uh, Moses says, oh, God says this to Moses. We're starting at verse 3. We're going to go down to verse 14, but we're going to skip a couple verses just to save time here. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and the top of the doorframe of the houses where they're going to eat the animal. That same night, they must roast the meat over a fire, eat it along with bitter bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry your stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is a day to remember. Each year, from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. So here Jesus is with his disciples, and they are, 1,500 years later, celebrating this festival. They are commemorating when God passed over and spared the, the families of the Israelites because of the blood of the lamb that was on the door. Everything Jesus did and does is intentional, right? There's always so much meaning. And I love this explanation of why Jesus chose Passover to institute communion. R.C. Sproul says this, Why then did Jesus institute the Lord's Supper on the Passover the night before his crucifixion? In the first place, it's because he is the fulfillment of all that was foreshadowed by the Passover lamb. His blood, the blood of the new covenant, averts the wrath of God for those who place their faith in him. Second, it is because the Last Supper was the eve of the prophesied greater new covenant act of redemption. The promised act of redemption that the prophets described in terms of a new exodus. And just as the first exodus was preceded by the institution of Passover, the greater new exodus was preceded by the institution of the Lord's Supper. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper on this night to signify that this new exodus was about to begin. This act indicated that the time of redemption had come. 
And oh, how humanity needed and needs this redemption. Friends, since Adam and Eve introduced sin into the DNA of humanity, we have not been able to fully stand in the presence of God's perfect holiness. God's also perfectly just, and his justice demanded that sin be paid for. But how? How could this sin be paid for, this sin that's made against a holy God? Well, Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And even though throughout the time before Jesus came, God made a temporary way for sin to be atoned for through the sacrificial system, this was never meant to be the ultimate system, the ultimate solution. Romans 3.25 explains why God allowed this to happen. It says that God put forward Jesus as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. And this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. God allowed the insufficient sacrifices because he knew that at the appointed time, he would send Jesus to pay for the sins of humanity. Jesus, friends, he lived a sinless life and he died an undeserved death on the cross. Because of Jesus, our sins, yours, mine, they can be forgiving, forgiven, and our standing with God can be restored. And now if you're here this morning, you're going, I don't, I don't think I've ever thought about that. I, I don't think that, you know, I, I have that connection to Jesus where, you know, his sacrifice would cover my sins. Well, you're in the perfect place. All you have to do to appropriate that sacrifice for yourself is to say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I know that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Please take my life and make it yours. And then friends, just as the blood of those first Passover lambs turned away the wrath of God from the houses of the Israelites, so too does the blood of Jesus apply to our accounts, turn away the wrath of God directed at our sin. So when God looks at me, he doesn't see Ashley prideful, judgmental, anxious. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. And because of that, not only can I come into the presence of God, but the very Holy Spirit of God can live inside of me day to day. So this morning, as we come together to the table, we are proclaiming together the generous, sacrificial death of Christ. We're proclaiming our need, our personal need, not just that person's need, but our personal need for Jesus. As we drink the juice and and we eat the bread, we are physically demonstrating that need. When we eat food and, and we drink water, we know that we have to do that to stay alive. If we stop doing that, we would just, we would perish. As we eat and we drink, we're demonstrating that same need that we have for God and for the sacrifice of Jesus. As we come to the table this morning, and I love this part, we are demonstrating our unity as the body of believers. You know, as we, as we sit here, you know, there's lots of different languages, lots of different backgrounds, ethnicities, political beliefs, you know, some different theological beliefs. But we come forward and we declare that we all are in need of the sacrifice of Jesus. We are unified through his body and through his blood. And so this morning, we're going to do something that we haven't done in a while. Pastor Ken mentioned it earlier. I am so excited. I've missed this. We're going to come forward for communion. And I want, as you are doing that, I want to encourage you to make your steps meaningful. Don't just kind of tune out and come forward, but I want you to, as you choose to stand, and as you choose to take each step, to say, this is my declaration that I am one with Christ. This is my declaration that I am declaring the body of Jesus until he comes. This is my declaration that I am in such desperate need of him every moment, every day, This is my declaration of the death and resurrection of Jesus.